Someone mentioned at the meeting the other night that the, of the 14 churches that were around when Eastside Ministries was, came to life 40 years ago, a majority of those churches no longer exist. They have died. And if someone had told somebody 40 years ago that one of the churches that would still be standing 40 years later was St. Matthew, they would have said, you are crazy. Here's the reading from the gospel today. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That is the word that is upon us. That is the word that we are called on to live by. You know how long this congregation's been around? In two years, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate, and we are going to celebrate it. We didn't celebrate our 125th anniversary. I don't know why. We celebrated our 100th anniversary, but we're going to celebrate our 130th year in two years. This congregation is 128 years old, a little younger than I am. Stephen Moore in the choir is a historical artifact. <laughs> We're going to have the boy framed and hang him out in the hall for everyone to see. Stephen is a direct descendant of, the, of one of the six or seven families who started Glenwood Methodist Episcopal Church South in 1896. Actually, they bought the, bought the land in 1896 for $1 from Mr. R. Vickery, the one the road is named after. And they built the church in 1897. This is it. I know you can't see it very well. It's a beautiful little thing. Little Victorian Gothic church, which, by the way, looks suspiciously like the shape of the front of our church now. And I rather think that our great architect, Greg Wyatt, may have been playing a little bit with history. I may have shown him this, uh, or I may not have. It may just be a traditional design. I want you to notice something interesting about it, though. The church has hitching posts out front. And you can picture people coming, women in their long dresses, men all dressed up, coming in their buggies, hitching the buggy outside, or hitching, or coming alone on a horse, hitching the horse outside. Somebody has to watch the buggies and the horses all during the worship service. And uh, going into that church, I'd love to have seen the inside of the church. I think it would be, be a beautiful little place to worship. But 1926, it got, <laughs> they considered it small and old and drafty. Had wallpaper on the walls, they said, but they could feel the wind coming through the chinks. So they built another building in 1926, a beautiful grand building over on Vickery Boulevard, which still stands. And I love the sanctuary in that building. It's a great round sanctuary, looking right down on the pulpit. And there's a great balcony around, as I recall it. Now, I've been in the building just to look at it. 
Uh, some other church is there now, or there may not be anybody in there now. I don't know, but the building is standing on Victory. And uh, they built that in, in, in 25, and in 1929, we got the stock market crash. And then the Depression. And they lost their beautiful building back to the bank. And through much of the 1930s, they ridded their building from the bank. But then in 1939, the conference, the Methodist Episcopal Church North and the Methodist Episcopal Church South were reuniting. They had divided in 1845 over slavery. They were coming back together. And uh, the conference told Glenwood, as we were called then, that Methodists do not rent their buildings. They own them, and they would have to decide whether to buy that building back or to leave it. And they voted to leave it. They had a big fuss over it. A lot of people left. Mrs. Holt told me that she knew somebody who died as a result of that. He died just shortly after that decision was made, and he had been much opposed to it. It may have been a bad decision, but then they built a couple of blocks over a little church called Ash Crescent. It's a stone church, still standing. Looks kind of like a small English chapel. And they were there until uh, all the mid-60s, but in 1962, they had another fuss. Now, what I'm telling you is this church has had several opportunities just to roll over and die. And it has just absolutely refused to do so. When they were building Ash Crescent, they built it all by hand themselves and they met under a tree on the property because they did not want to owe anything when the building was completed. But in 1962, Ash Crescent wanted to move and they wanted to move out this way and they had a big argument over location. Some of them wanted to move one place and some of them wanted to move here. And uh, they split into Eastern Hills and into St. Matthew. Became two churches. And in 1966, the St. Matthew bunch, by the way, talk about division in the family. There were divisions within families at that time. Some family went that way, some family went this way. <laughs> mostly everybody who had any money went to Eastern Hills and everybody who didn't stay for that to, became St. Matthew. But they did build this building in 1966. And another church, Eastwood Methodist, merged with them soon after they moved into this building. Well, it wasn't actually a merger. It was kind of like a train wreck. Uh, they just threw two... Con mergers take a lot of planning. This one, they just ran them. The conference just ran them together. Eastwood was on the verge of dying, and so they moved the foot. But it had a pretty good congregation. And over the next 10 years, well, they spent those years declining. And here's part of the reason. The church still had this uh, hitching post mentality. They had a choice when they moved out here of whether to build it on this lot or the lot down on the road where everybody could see the church. But that lot cost $1,000 more. And anyway, they had in mind, well, you know, here's a new community just growing out here. We'll just put it right up in that community. And that has made a huge difference in the life of this church because we've always had to fight the fact that <laughs> People don't know we're here. Well, we were about gone in 1982. There were, you know, 25, 30 on Sunday mornings, and the conference had no hope for us. They couldn't get a preacher to come here because everybody thought the church was dying. But remember, when a church that refuses to die just will not die under any circumstances. Uh, so they sent me here to preside over this place while it died. But instead of dying, we began to grow a little bit. Family of people who were here and a few friends, they came in. 
And then the growth stopped. And four or five years into my tenancy as pastor, there was no growth to coming. And we didn't know where to get it. We'd go out into the neighborhoods and we would knock on doors. We would knock on a hundred doors. We did finally get one person to come and visit. He stayed on. But children, that method was going to wear our knuckles out. Ain't no, ain't no future in, in door knocking if you just get one member out of a hundred houses. So we had to have something else. Well, I, I just have kind of a natural tendency <laughs> to put little articles in the paper. When I was in high school, I started putting a little article in the Kemp News every week. And what I talked about was school activities, and I generally made fun of my classmates and my teachers in a joking way. I remember one of our class sponsors was Mrs. Wingo. And uh, Mrs. Wingo... Uh, used, to, used, to, used to dance with all the boys at the class dances. And I put in the paper one time, we found out that Mrs. Wingo can dance at any speed. 78, 45, and 33 and a third. <laughs> the week after that came out, she came to me and said, Max, you have gotten me in big trouble. She said, I'm a Baptist. I'm not supposed to be dancing at any speed. Well, anyway, I decided what we could do would be to put a little article in the Meadowbrook shopper each week. And I remember the first one I wrote was about some flowers I had transplanted from along the side of the road, which I stole. You're not supposed to do that. And put them in my garden. And I talked, this was getting close to Easter. I was talking about how they were blooming. And during the, during the next few years, I, I talked a lot about the, the, uh, I talked about the thing that was so big back then, which was the mess that was going on in the TV church, Jimmy and Tammy Faye, and uh, Jimmy Swaggart, Pat Robertson, and uh, made a lot of people mad, uh, but it made a lot of people glad. And the church began to grow. In fact, it grew so much over the next few years. In 1988, 89, we were sometimes hitting, I believe this, 160 on Sunday mornings. Yes, indeed, children, we were. And I'm glad we did because we decided that building was too small, the sanctuary is too small, and so we had this whole sanctuary rebuilt. The pulpit used to be down there and the choir was down there, and this was just a small glass entrance back here. And uh, people used to get mad at me when I said this, but most of those folks are gone now, and, and Stephen may agree with me. The church was kind of ugly. It was, it was not a pretty church. People used to tell me, oh, I saw that, but I thought it was a nursing home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well... So we glorified it, and it's, I, I consider it one of the most beautiful sanctuaries in, in Fort Worth. And I love the old pulpit. It's from about 1830, 1840 from Scotland. I remember Raleigh Yorth. I know most of you don't know Raleigh. We went to an antique shop in Forney and picked it up. The architect was going to build one similar to it for $4,000. We got that one for $650. And Eileen Ingleson Stearns, who, who, who died just this last year after moving to Oklahoma, they continued to watch and to love this church. She, she and I uh, refinished it. And uh, it looks like it belongs there. Well, it has for many, many years now. But uh, remember, uh, it's, uh, it's from Scotland. And you need to understand it's Presbyterian and we're Methodist, so we don't, I don't know what we'll do about that. And, you know, what would, it, what would it be like if you took out Johnny and Judy here, well, all the people back this way, and starting over here with Carol and all of those people, and Joe and Joan, and on back, 
What would it be like if most of the people who are here today were not here? And most of them, including some of those folks sitting back there, almost everyone has come in through that thing in the paper. Even recently, Annette is shaking her head, yes. And two new members who are about to join, they came in that way. It's, it is still our lifeline. But that's not perhaps not the most important thing about it. It is a ministry unto itself. Yes, it has saved the life of this church, and that's why we're still here. You know, can, can, you, can you believe that Hansley is gone, died at the age of 145? Well, if you can get children in the church, you can live. Well, they had a, a children's program, a, a daycare program, and a preschool. I'd go over there during the week, and there were children all over the place, but it got to where on Sunday morning, there was... Not enough people in the pews to maintain the life of the church. Well, a church can do good deeds and grow. I read about a church recently that uh, they had 130 people every week in a, uh, in a food program where they fed the hungry and they would come into the church for that. But the 12 people left in the pews on Sunday could not maintain that. A church cannot grow since the time of the automobile by depending on the community right around the church. It just doesn't happen. So what I am so thankful for is that this little experiment which we tried beginning in 1987 allows us to still be here today and to still be in ministry. Allows this church to be working for the Lord. And, and let me tell you something. We are, uh, we are reaching people that we actually never even know that we reach. Got a couple of letters here somewhere. Here's, here's someone. From someone who always uh, reads your column. Your column today is very interesting and helps me understand concepts that I have struggled with for 85 years. How can someone who loves us also rain terror and destruction upon us? From your column today, I know that doesn't happen. Keep up the good work. I'm living proof that one is never too old to be productive and learn. She says she's 85 years old. School teacher for 45 years. Got a letter from De Leon, Texas, where he tells me that he opens his Sunday school class each, each Sunday, often with an article from the paper. Same things happens in a Sunday school class over at Hurst. This church reaching so many more people and this is our doing, not just my doing, reaching so many more people than just the folks who are here on Sunday morning. Now we do sometimes need some help with some of those people. Those of you watching online, if you want to send in a gift this week for our great giving Sunday, you can do so. Winston asked me to mention this before the offering. If you go to our home page, right under the word home, he points out to me. I never look at the fine print. <laughs> there is the word give. And if you click on that, you can find how to give to this church. But the extraordinary thing is that we are still here. And I am determined. And Mary is determined, and all of us are determined, that a church that preaches the gospel, and the gospel is that God loves all people, all people unconditionally, that that church can live and survive. We did have someone 
Well, we've got people who come in from the neighborhood. Some of you have come in from the neighborhood. We give thanks for you. We had a lady who visited not too long ago, a couple of months ago. And, uh, boy, after that first service, she just loved it. Loved it. The next Sunday, uh, I mentioned something about the gay issue. I probably said something like, uh, God doesn't care whether a person is gay or not because it doesn't make any difference. And I looked back at that lady and I thought, this is her last Sunday. And it was. A church she loved one week, she did not love the next. But what we are able to do, you know, we don't have much fighting in St. Matthew. Arguments. I say they're rare, they're almost non-existent because what we do is we call together people of like mind from a large area and I'm looking at ways possibly even to expand that area and reach even more people. We're looking for those people of like mind who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who know that God is good. This is a Jesus church. You can go around all over and you can see Bible churches. And that's fine. We don't, we don't worship the Bible. The Bible was not nailed to the cross for you and me. It was Christ our Lord. This is a Jesus church. And the great commission is upon us. It is upon us. It is directly from the Lord who told us to go and reach people, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ, call the men to gather, and call them into the kingdom, and tell the world, all people, they are loved. That's the word that is upon us. That is the calling that we are working on. So many wonderful churches. You think Eastern Hills was not a great church? It was a great church. You think Handley was not a good church? It was a, it was a great church. But you cannot grow the church just from people who live on Acapulco Street. You've got to find a way to reach them. In the world, we're called to proclaim the gospel to as much of the world as we can. This sermon today is just a sermon of thanksgiving. For what? For the fact that St. Matthew United Methodist Church, by the grace and power of God, is still here. I also wanted to fill you in on a little history because most of you didn't know all of that. And unfortunately, I'm about the only one who does know all of that. Join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we are thankful to you because you know you promised that you would be with us always. And it has been our experience that you have been with us always. And this makes all of the difference in our lives. We are here because you have loved us and we have loved you and you have led us to do those things that allow us to continue in your name. In your holy name we pray. Amen.